From the Mahabharat by Carol Satyamurti As morning broke on the opening day of war, the rising sun streaked the sky with scarlet. The heat slowly burned off the mist that hung over the plain. The opposing armies, division upon division, stretched away as far as the eye followed the curving earth. All was brilliant. The chariots of the princes and all the royal allies were resplendent with noble banners, each with its own emblem. One king's standard carried a scarlet bull, another a boar on a cloth of silver, another bright flowers, stars, eagles, comets. The sight too dazzling to take in. Some kings were riding in their chariots, others sat erect on the necks of elephants or on sprited horses proudly wheeling. So much armour on elephants, horses, men. The flashing gold and bronze rivalled the sun. The close-packed troops and beasts, constantly moving, glittered like a river thick with fish. Both armies were terrible, both beautiful. In both, men's hearts were filled with joy and pride at being part of this huge event, this grand spectacle, this sacrifice, this the well-trained warrior's highest calling. Fear, suffering and grief would follow later. With the two armies facing one another, one east, one west, with ten thousand conches blaring out in challenge, the din of cymbals and the deep, heart-stopping throb of war drums. Arjun said to Krishna, his charioteer, Drive this chariot into no man's land, so I can see before the battle starts the face of the enemy I must kill. Krishna did what Arjun asked of him. And there... With every soldier tense and ready, with every horse straining at its yoke, there in the moment before hell's unleashing, with each blade wetted, every weapon honed, there in the moment when the frenzy of preparation is over and the din of death not yet begun, there at that point in the relentless passage of events, Time freezes. Arjun sinks to his chariot. His warrior's heart has failed him. His eyes stream with tears. His limbs tremble. The bow drops from his nerveless hand. The world holds its breath. For Karan, Kunti, for his brothers, for Krishna, for each differently. Arjun is the point, the mainspring of the action. He is the hero on whom all the hopes of the Pandavas are pinned. The obstacle above all others, the son of Dhritarashtra, sees as blocking his road to victory. Arjuna has fought scores of bloody battles, exulting at the slaughter of enemies, threshing them like standing stooks of grain, without regret, never looking back. He is the supreme Kshatriya. The whole effort of his life is geared to heroism and glorious victory. But now he is unraveled by distress. He gazes at the rank on rank of kinsmen. They are so familiar, human as he is. How to make them stranger to him than strangers? Death takes on new weight, sharper meaning. Whether this war brings victory or defeat, there will be no occasion for rejoicing. Striking his brow, he cries aloud to Krishna, I will not fight. A Kshatriya enters battle to preserve dharma. But how can it be right to kill our kinsmen, to coldly slaughter those who have nurtured, taught and grown with us? There is Dron, our dear teacher, and Bhishma, Beloved grandfather to us all, he looks so serene, full of resolve. Has he not imagined how it will be to aim his arrows at the heart of those joined to him by blood? 
who once were children gathered round enraptured by his stories? Look at all our cousins standing there, sick with greed and anger. But Krishna, even though they are blind to their own evil, even though they are desperate to kill us, how can we who know dharma do the same? I feel already the familiar heft of Gandiva flexing to dispatch death at those I should protect, my kin. How can I cut them down as though they were re rank weeds? Krishna smiles as at a foolish child. Son of Kunti, your doubts sound honorable, but they spring from deep misunderstanding. You speak as if this life was all there is, but it is just one brief embodiment of the eternal soul, the indestructible. Bodies are born, they flourish, age and die, but the soul, part of the greater spirit that infuses everything that exists, was never born and cannot be killed. That soul, the witness of our every thought and action, persists from one life to the next. It sloughs off its old and worn body as one discards old cloths and puts on new. Wise people know this and do not lament. Those men you see lined up, eager for battle, full of the beauty of their youth and strength, are dead already. Their bodies which have known cold and heat, pleasure and suffering, already carry death and decomposition in their bones. You need to understand, Arjun, that in this life, nothing is permanent. Nothing can be held or truly owned. The individual I a person clings to, the ego with a sense of past and future, furnished with intentions and memories, is simply an illusion. There is only one, an infinite, proce infinite procession of present moments. Time is the present, to be experienced, enjoyed, endured, misery and pleasure equally. Beings have mysterious origins. They emerge into the light and then disappear into shadow. Why should this cause grief? Within the framework of a single life, each individual has their dharma, the path of right action they should follow, depending on the station they occupy. Your dharma is to fight. That is your purpose. You were born for this, and it is for this that praise singers will extol your memory long after you are dead. Think. To refuse would lead to deep, deep disgrace. People would say, when it came to it, he was a coward. What could be more miserable than that for a Kshatriya? Fight as a warrior should and you cannot lose. Either you are killed and go to heaven or win and enjoy the kingdom. So get to your feet, scratch off your enemies, say your strength, Arjun, and fight.